Hey guys, if we haven't met yet, my name is Hans Christensen and I'm the lead pastor of Marsfield Community Church. It's great to have you with us. We're all on about the Lord Jesus and so everything that we do today is going to hopefully glorify Him. That's what we want for everything to do. Uh, over this next three weeks, we have got a special guest preacher with us, Al Stewart, who's the Fellowship of Independent Evangelical Churches National Director, and he will be speaking to us from the book of Daniel, and he'll, he's called this sermon series Unshakable, and it's all about having unshakable faith in a faithless world. And so uh, it's going to be a great time, it's going to be an encouraging time. But right now what we're going to do is we're going to sing our first song, One My Heart, and then Dana is going to bring our first Bible reading and Jean is going to pray.
Today's first Bible reading is Mark chapter 8, verses 34 to 38. So if you could please flick your Bibles to here. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Hi everyone, my name is Jean, um, and I'll be leading us uh, today in prayer. Um, as Christians, we believe that God is all-powerful and that he listens to his people. Uh, and so that's why we pray. We pray to him to thank him for the things that he's given us and also to bring our requests before him. So if you uh, would like to, please join with me as I pray. Our Father in heaven, you are the God of love. Uh, the Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, that you are love. You show your love to us daily through the many blessings you've given us but you showed your love to us in the most amazing way possible when you gave us Jesus. Because Jesus died for us to cleanse us of our sins and then came back to life so that we can have eternal life with you. God, when you love, you love sacrificially and you love without being loved first. So Lord, help us to love others the same way you love us. Help us to love others when it's hard or inconvenient for us. Help us to love others, even if it means that it will cost us time, money, or popularity. Help us to love others, even if we won't be recognized or appreciated for it. We pray this especially during these COVID times, uh, as we live in the midst of uncertainty, fear, and conflicting messages from all around us. We pray that as those who follow Christ, our actions would always be guided by your love. Uh, in particular, May we take good care of the vulnerable, such as those who are older or sick, even if it means limiting our own freedoms. We continue to pray for your mercy upon Australia and the world during this time, that you would limit the spread of the virus and limit the suffering and death. Father, you are the God of peace. Through Jesus, you have secured for us an eternity with you where there will be no conflict or suffering. But in this world now, there is still much suffering as people fight and oppress each other. We think of Hong Kong. There's been so much violence and unrest around the protests, which have now gone on for over a year. We pray for justice for the people of China and Hong Kong. We pray that their leadership may be one that leads fairly and for the good of its people. We pray for an end to the rioting, the oppression and the violence. We pray for your peace. And finally, Lord, you are the God who loves his church. We, uh, we pray for your church in this time as we make plans to meet face to face again. We long to meet again together, as is right. And we pray for your wisdom in doing so in a way that is safe and loving to each other and to our neighbours. Please guide Hans, Kate, Tim and the leadership team at our church through this process and help us to be humble and understanding through what will be a difficult process. And we pray that you would keep our eyes fixed on Jesus this week and beyond. And we pray all of this in his name. Amen. Hey guys, even though the lockdown is happening, there's still a bunch of stuff on. Uh, the first thing I want you to do though, is I want you to click on the communication card link that should be down below. Let us know that you're here and let us know if there's anything that we can do for you. It will be great to see if there is any way we can help you. Um, but there is one announcement and it's for the ladies. Guys, you can listen in if you really want, but it's definitely for the ladies. Um, Every quarter, the ladies gather together and have this thing called Flourish, where they hear a Bible talk from a woman, uh, you, you know, just for them, I guess. And so our next Flourish is Saturday the 1st of August at 2 p.m. And it's going to be a great time for the ladies to gather together to encourage people as they journey with Jesus and uh, to hear from God's Word. Um, and instead of meeting as a big group as, as the women usually do for Flourish, uh, you know, the, the girls will be breaking up into small groups around uh, this area. And, and we've got a great uh, speaker named Kylie Wilson. Uh, she'll be continuing to look at the parables of Jesus and seeing how God's um, kingdom grows. 
Uh, so here's what I want you to do. Please RSVP via the email link that you will receive today. And the organising team will gather uh, different groups of ladies together and uh, in, in different uh, small groups around this area. And the cost is $147. Actually, no, it's only $5, which is a bargain. So you want to get on that very quick. And uh, $5 just to cover the cost of the speaker. And so this is going to be a great time for you ladies to, to uh, come together, hear a great talk and have great fellowship. But right now, what we're going to do is we're going to have our second Bible reading. Dana's going to bring that to us, and then Al is going to preach to us. The second Bible reading is Daniel chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language of literature of Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. Among these were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names to Daniel, the name Belteshazzar to Hananiah, to Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Aben Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the official for permission to defile himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I am afraid of the Lord the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then, the, then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food. And treat your servants in accordance with that with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the other young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their food choice and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them in, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, so they entered the king's service. In every manner of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in this whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Well, I think you can safely say our world is in chaos at the moment. Uh, with the virus in terms of health and sickness and people dying, um, economies all around the world, who knows what is going to happen apart from a world of pain that's coming. Uh, I read the other day the geopolitical arm wrestling between the USA and China and other nations and it's chaotic. And even in Australia, uh, in our lifetime, uh, we haven't seen things like this happen. Uh, who is in control of our world? It can very easily feel like, I understand, that it feels like no one is in control. And yet, what we believe about God and is he in control of our world will have a huge effect on the way we look to the future and uh, our levels of anxiety or confidence. 
Now, the book of Daniel is written about two and a half thousand years ago, but it's actually written to show us who is in control of our world. It's written in, I guess you could say, more than chaotic times for people who had a trust in the God of the Bible. And yet, what the book of Daniel shows is four young men, Daniel and his three friends, who are able to live in times of chaos with confidence uh, and certainty and wisdom because of what they believe about God. Uh, let me give you some quick breakdown. We're going to look at the book of Daniel, or just three chapters. Uh, chapter one is about, um, how can we put it, about seduction, about the call to give in and just fit in with what the world out there wants. Uh, we're going to look at chapter two about what is God doing in the world and, if you like, the, the long game that God is playing. And we'll look at chapter four, some hard lessons in humility. So let's get rolling uh, and see what Daniel teaches us about uh, who's in charge of our world. Chapter one is about uh, the pressure to fit in in the sense of seduction, to just uh, do you go with the flow. And in this way, uh, people who have their trust in Jesus can be like uh, the drunk guy on the donkey, you know, fall off one side or fall off the other. One, one way that some some Christian people react is to kind of circle the wagons, uh, stay away from the non-Christian world, have nothing to do with it, isolate himself, uh, feel really defensive. The other wrong way to fall off the donkey is to just fit in and be no different uh, to the non-Christian world, to just accept the ethics, to just say things like same-sex marriage or euthanasia or abortion or whatever, well, it's all okay, and sort of like my Staffordshire Terrier does, roll over and want a belly rub from the non-Christian world. So one way to fall off, completely withdraw. The other way is kind of to just fit in. But there's another way, and you see that in Daniel chapter 1. So let's have a look. <clears throat> uh, Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. <clears throat> The armies of Babylon invaded Judah uh, in 605 BC and then a number of other times they came back and destroyed the city. Uh, the first time they did, we're told, chapter 1, verse 2, and the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles of the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Uh, you see three successive invasions, 605, 597 and 587 BC. And what Nebuchadnezzar did was not to, dis not to uh, kill all the people, but, but he took the cream of the crop, the best, the most educated, the most capable, and took them from Jerusalem back to Babylon. He really wanted to take the skill and the ability out of the country and use it for his empire. Of course, um, Daniel and his three friends are caught up in that uh, deportation back to Babylon. Now, there's a theological problem there for the people of Jerusalem, and that is they were God's promised, God's chosen people, and they were living in the promised land, and God had made promises to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David about them living in the land. And yet the Babylonians have come, conquered them, and dragged them out of the land. How do you explain that. We'll come back to that later. So the Babylonian Empire was huge. Here's a map. You see it kind of stretched across the, the known world. How do you rule a giant empire like that? Uh, Nebuchadnezzar could be a ruthless tyrant, but he's also a very clever man. Now, he didn't have emails or uh, mobile phones or voicemail or, or Zoom meetings. So he was able to actually get some stuff done rather than be interrupted all the time. But what do you do? Well, you get the very best and the cleverest of your people uh, from around the empire and you bring them together and get them to fall in love with Babylonian culture, get them to understand how the empire works. And that's exactly what the king decided to do. See chapter 1, verse 3. The king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family the nobility, uh, sorry, and the nobility. Verse 4, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand and qualified to serve in the king's palace. 
He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. Verse 5, the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table and they were to be trained for three years and after that they were to enter the king's service. It was an invitation to get this, perhaps we could call it scholarship, was the opportunity to be involved in ruling the world uh, as the Babylonians did. It's an idea that's been copied in the modern world as well. So Cecil Rhodes, who um, an Englishman and uh, the founder of Rhodesia in Africa, began the Rhodes Scholarship. Uh, and uh, you've no doubt heard of Rhodes Scholars. Uh, in, um, he died in 1902. There's one of my friends, uh, Elizabeth, was a Rhodes Scholar. And I couldn't help but think how Daniel chapter 1, the offer to work for the king and a scholarship, the Rhodes Scholarship was similar. So I wrote to her and said, what do you think about Daniel chapter 1? Here's what she said is when she wrote back. She said, the Rhodes Trust was set up after Cecil Rhodes died in 1902. The website says, Mr Rhodes dreamed of improving the world through the diffusion of leaders motivated to serve their contemporaries. Actually, she says, it was more sinister. The Rhodes scholars were explicitly intended to promote the interests of the British Empire around the world. We were all supposed to come to Oxford, be captivated by the glories of England and go forth as missionaries around the world to lead the colonies and make sure that they, uh, they acted in the interests of the empire. And she goes on to say, or just to show how once you're a Rhodes Scholar, doors to success just open. And you see Daniel and his three friends are caught up in this. Uh, they have the world on a platter. And really, uh, Babylon ruled the world. We've got uh, some pictures here of what Babylon would have looked like, their artist's impressions of what Babylon would have looked like at the time of Daniel. You know, Babylon's a city in modern-day Iraq. Uh, the scholars tell me the city walls were large enough for chariots to pass each other on the walls, and the walls ran for 27 kilometres. There's a magnificent Ishtar gates, which are now in a German museum. Uh, here's a picture of the hanging gardens of Babylon that Nebuchadnezzar built because one of his wives missed her mountain homeland. A lot of work to uh, make his wife happy. So Daniel and his three friends could have had the world on a platter. And it would have been easy to think that God's cause looked very small compared to the power of Babylon. In verse 6, we're introduced to Daniel and his friends. Verse 6, among these, those chosen for the internship, among these were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names, to Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach and to Azariah, Abednego. Uh, Daniel's Jewish name uh, means God is my judge. And then Daniel's friends, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, are all derived, names derived from the God of Israel. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego are names that come from uh, the Babylonian gods. And Daniel's given the name Belteshazzar. Now, they, the four young men accept, uh, accept these names. Why? At the same time as the book of Daniel is written, God is speaking to the exiles in Babylon through the prophet Jeremiah. And Jeremiah says this in Jeremiah 29, verse 4, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, in Babylon. Uh, and verse 7, uh, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. In other words, you're going to be there for a long time, as it turned out, a lifetime for these guys. You're going to be there for a long time and so cooperate, be useful, uh, fit in where you can, where you're able. And so they do fit in, they learn... Uh, the education system of the Babylonians. They learn their culture, their laws. They understand their gods and astrology. Now, they don't worship their gods, but they understand the system. But it is interesting that you see in chapter 1, there's a line that Daniel and his friends will not cross. So they fit in where they can, but they draw the line at 
See verse 8. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Uh, here's a picture, kind of a Sunday school picture, of Daniel and his three young friends saying no to the, the beautiful food and wine from the king's table. You notice the picture, they look like kids. Well, that's pretty accurate. The book of Daniel shows us that Daniel had a, uh, a career in the king's, multiple kings, in their service for well over 60 years. And so it's likely, maybe 66 plus years. So it's likely that Daniel was only in his early teens when he did this, when he stood up this way. Now, why does he decide not to eat the food and wine from the king's table? Lots of different theories. Some people have said, well, that's because they couldn't eat pork. It was ritually unclean. I think, yeah, but why is it they couldn't drink the wine? Um, others have said, well, it was because all that food was sacrificed to the gods, uh, the Babylonian gods. But it's also likely that the vegetables that they eat were sacrificed to the gods. And what you see later, if you've got your Bible there, you could have a look later. In chapter 10, verse 3, when Daniel's an old man, he is eating meat and drinking wine. So why does he decide it now? Well, the best explanation I can come up with is this. Daniel and his friends realise there's no free lunches. That is, if you eat with someone, <clears throat> you're accepting them and it brings obligation. After all, if you get to the New Testament, one of the great criticisms of Jesus is that he ate with sinners, which means that he... He had a fellowship that he accepted them. It's the same today. Uh, why is it that in the corporate world, uh, company executives buy each other lunches? Or why is it that uh, they have corporate boxes at the football for, for customers? Do you remember football? It's where guys used to play with a ball on a big field and it'll come back one day. But why? Uh, because hospitality brings obligation. And Daniel understood that. And Daniel and his friends say, they draw the line and say, no, we're, we're not for sale. We will not eat at the king's table in that way, uh, even though the king was unaware of it. Very different to uh, the book of two kings in the Bible. 2 Kings 25, 27 to 30 tells us Jehoiachin, who had been king of Jerusalem, gets let out of prison and he eats like a lapdog at the table of the king of Babylon every day. So the king of Jerusalem caved in, but Daniel and his three young friends stand firm. We're not exactly sure why they drew the line here. I guess the point is there was a line and they drew it. So they decide to give up meat, uh, give up meat for years. And give up meat is a big call. I'm a guy who would very happily have a dessert steak uh, most nights, but it's what Daniel and his friends do. Now, it's a decision and also a dangerous decision. You see verse 9. Now, God had caused the official to show favour and sympathy to Daniel, verse 10, but the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my Lord, the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why, should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age, the king would have my head because of you. So the um, he realises to disobey the king in this means people are going to lose their heads. So what does Daniel do? Well, he politely tries, uh, asks the steward who is a little lower down the food chain. He tries again, just with a different person in the food chain. Verse 11, Daniel then said to the guard, whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, verse 12, Please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Daniel then said, um, then compare our appearance, verse 11, then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. And so the guard took away their choice food and wine uh, they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. I suspect it was not hard to work out where all the great food and wine ended up. But then uh, between verse 16 and 17 is three years. So uh, Daniel, as, as the narrator tells the story, we jump three years to the end of the internship and we see what happens. 
verse 17. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel can understand visions and dreams of all kinds. Comes very significant later. Verse 18. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them in, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. 19. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Uh, Cyrus conquered Babylon in 539 BC. That's around 66 years later. And so Daniel served one king after another for, for well over 60 years. And this chapter uh, sets the scene for the life of Daniel. He's uh, calm and solid and honourable, as I said, for more than six decades. And if you read the book of Daniel, he won't be seduced by the offer of, you know, ruling the world with Nebuchadnezzar, and he won't be intimidated. You see that in chapters 3 and chapter 6 by the threat of persecution. Now, why could he do that? Why could he stand firm and confident in the middle of uh, seduction and threat and, a, and chaos in terms of the wider world? Well, it's because he understood who's in charge. And it seems like God's absent in this chapter until you really look. And, and let me show you three times very clearly God appears. The power of God is obvious. The first time, uh, God go, or let me put it this way. There's three times it says God gave, God intervenes. The first time uh, is in chapter 1, verse 2. And the Lord delivered or gave, the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. God delivered the king of Judah into Nebuchadnezzar's hand. Remember I said there was a theological problem that they were the promised, uh, the, the, the chosen people of God and in the promised land. The, pro the problem is that promise depended on them responding in faith and trust to God. And they didn't. The people of Jerusalem and Judah had walked away from God and ignored him. And God had warned them and warned them and warned them quite literally for centuries. Warned them if they kept walking away, he would throw them out of the land. And finally he did. So the first time, chapter 1, verse 2, God controls the nations and God controls history. The second time that you see God intervene in chapter 1, verse 9. Now, God had caused the official to show favour and sympathy to Daniel. What's it showing? At a much smaller level, God controls the hearts and minds of people. Uh, Daniel knew his fate was not in the hands of this Babylonian bureaucrat. His fate were actually in the hands of God. And so Daniel didn't fear people and their power. And the third, in chapter 1, verse 17, to these four young men... God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature. That is, God is the one who gives gifts and abilities. Uh, and so Daniel, for all his brilliance, could remain humble. There you go. Three times. Uh, God is the one who controls the nations. God is the one who controls people. God is the one who gives us gifts and abilities. Confidence and humility at the same time. So let's try and just pull a lesson out of that. How do you live as a follower of Jesus in our world? Uh, Jesus is very clear that to follow him will cost. So, for example, in Mark chapter 8, verse 34, he says this, Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. The idea is to, to say no to self. Deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. You see, often to follow Jesus, it will cost, won't it? It might mean saying no to different jobs or job prospects. It, it, for you, it may mean saying no to getting romantically involved with someone who doesn't follow Jesus because it would make it so hard to follow him. It might mean being mocked or rejected even in your own family. But understanding the sovereignty of God, that God is king, means that he can look after us and we know that. And so the way that we respond, it doesn't have to be like the drunk guy on the donkey. We don't have to, you know, um, 
circle the wagons and have nothing to do with the, the non-Christian world, uh, or we don't have to kind of roll over, want a belly rub and just blend in. What do you see Daniel do? He, he cooperates where he can. He takes the internship. He learns the education. He works brilliantly for the king. He cooperates, but he won't compromise. He, he won't give in on certain things that are really important. So to cooperate, but not compromise. And he draws a, a line in the sand, if you like, where there's things he won't do. The New Testament gives us principles for how to act rather than detailed rules. And so different people who follow Jesus will draw that line in different places. The really significant thing here is if you follow Jesus, there needs to be that line or those lines need to be drawn. And it may look different for different people. Um, I'll work really well in my job. I will go the extra mile. I'll be the greatest employee. But I will not sell my soul to the to the company. I will not breach my own ethical standards. I will have a life outside of work. Or I'll go for drinks on Friday afternoon with everyone and, and socialise, but I will not get drunk and I will leave at the right time. Or uh, I will love my family. I'll care for my parents. I will be the best son or daughter you know, on the planet. But if my family are not followers of Jesus, I will not compromise on belonging to a church or in other areas. You see, also, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, um, can you see the difference that that makes when you understand that God holds history in his hands, uh, the God who controls the nations, the God who controls people's actions, the God who gives us good things can be trusted. It changes the way that we face the future. You pray with me? Please, God, we ask that we would be able to see clearly that you are the one who controls the nations, even when we can't see what's happening, that you are the one who controls people and their actions, and you are the one who gives us good things in our lives. And we ask, please, that we might be able to face the future with trust rather than anxiety. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, guys, wasn't that great to be encouraged uh, about having great faith, strong faith in a, in a world that is, doesn't have faith in the Lord Jesus? And so with that in mind, what we're going to do, we're going to respond to God in song and we're going to stand and we're going to sing when I survey. Why don't you stand and sing with us?
So guys, uh, thank you for being with us. I hope you're encouraged as you uh, heard from God's word, as you sung praises to him, as you prayed to him. And what I hope is that you walk out in, back into the world and live with unshakable faith in this world that doesn't have its faith in Jesus. And we'll see you next week.